some ninjas it wallets from Golang Dojo. Today we are going through seven common mistakes that Go beginners often make so that you can submit your next code review with more confidence instead of feeling like an imposter. Also, at the end of this video, I will cover a bonus tip that many beginners tend to neglect, so make sure to stick around for that. Before we get started, make sure to get your free Golang cheat sheet at golangdojo.com slash cheat sheet. That said, let's get right into the video. The very first mistake Go beginners often make is assuming passing by address is always faster than passing by value. Here is a simple example. Let's say that we have a ninja struct with many different fields for more details about the ninja. At the same time, there are two functions, one of which takes in the ninja as a parameter by value, while the other takes in the ninja by pointer. The assumption commonly made here is the second function will always perform better because it's passing by address, which means it doesn't have to do a copy of all of the member fields. However, that assumption is not always true. If we take these two functions a step further and return the ninja object and the pointer of the ninja object respectively, and then write benchmarks for both of these functions, we will discover that the first function, which takes in and returns the ninja by value, is actually more performant than the second function, which it takes in and returns the ninja by address. But this doesn't really make much sense, right? Because if we pass an object by value, then we have to copy all of the fields in that object compared to passing by address. The key concept to understand here to explain this is whether the values are stored in the stack or stored in the heap. Often, values are stored in the stack when copied by value, and values are stored in the heap when copied by point. Because the value the pointer is pointing to needs to be kept alive even after the function is a pop off of the function stack. This means that the values on the stack are self-cleaning, while the values on the heap require the involvement of the garbage collector. Additionally, if we were to add a concurrency into the mix, parameters that pass by value will live in the corresponding GoRoutine function stacks, whereas parameters passed by address will live in the common heap and accessible by multiple GoRoutines and this can further worsen the performance. The next mistake Go beginners often make is not using enough interfaces. Interfaces in Go are very powerful, and many features in other languages are consolidated in Go with the usage of interfaces. Let's take a look at this example from one of my personal projects. This is a simplified version of the session management project that I worked on. As you can see, the create and check session function takes in a parameter of a type sessions input. Notice that this is a concrete struct type. The code that we currently have works perfectly fine if we only have a single implementation of sessions. However, as I continued to work on this project, I quickly found out I need a different implementation of sessions. If I want to use this new implementation, I would need to call the create and check session function by providing a new instance of this new implementation. Now, this obviously wouldn't work and it will give us a compiling error because the create and check session function takes in a parameter of a different type. Now, what should we do here? Should we keep the same function but update the parameter type? Or should we add an additional function with this new implementation? These brute force solutions simply aren't going to work because they require us to revisit and refactor our code every time we add a new implementation. This is where interfaces come into play. We can add an interface with a common method and then update the type of the function parameter to this newly created interface. This is especially applicable when you are writing tests. For example, if you have a struct with a member variable of type interface that you want to test. 
because the member variable is of a type sessions, an interface type, we can create a mark session struct type that implements the interface method with marked behaviors. You can use this mark struct in order to instantiate the components that you're actually trying to test. Next, let's talk about loop breaks in switch slash select statements. Let's use this example that attempts to break the for loop when the channel receives a break signal. As you can see, we have an infinite for loop even though we have a select statement that attempts to break the for loop when it receives the break signal. That's because a break statement not only breaks for loops but also attempts to break switch and select statements. So in order to have the break statement to break where we intended to, we would need to add a label for the for loop and provide the break statements with the label of the for loop. This type of mistakes can easily be overlooked because it's a runtime error. And especially in a casual side project without a full test coverage. The next mistake that Go beginners often make is blindly using third-party test libraries. There are actually quite a few test libraries that, that may be very popular, however, are not very enigmatic. For example, here we have two unit test functions testing the session implementation that we had as an example earlier in this video. The first function uses the native testing package and checks the result manually with an if statement, which is recommended by the Go team. The second unit test uses the third-party test library testify, which uses asserts instead of if statement. At first glance, these two functions do exactly the same thing. However, there's actually a minor difference. The first function where we use the native testing package actually encourages us to use a fatal instead of error, which grants us a more fine-grained control, such as terminating the unit test sooner. And these potential performance improvements can easily add up in a larger and more complex project. Similarly, there are third-party test libraries such as marking libraries that typically uses reflection instead of manually implementing mark struct. This can introduce additional performance drag as well. Next, we have a variable scoping when working with Go routines. Now, pay special attention for the next 10 seconds because I've got a question for you. Here, we have a simple set of instructions utilizing Go routines. My question for you is, what do you think the three digits are that this concurrent program will end up printing out? Is it one, two, three, or the same numbers but in a non-deterministic order? Now, for loops are not concurrently saved by default, so by when the newly spun up Go routines that try to print out the integer i, the main Go routine has most likely already looped to the last element in the slice s. Therefore, this program will most likely print out 333. Three, three. And if we actually want to have the program print out all three numbers exactly once, and at the same time still take advantage of the Go routines that Go provides, there are two potential easy solutions. As you can see, both solutions require us to pay closer attention to the scope of the variables that we pass down to the newly spun up Go routine. The next mistake Go beginners often make is related to the non-addressability of certain built-in types in Go. Let's take a look at this simple example of how map values are actually not addressable. The third line here will unfortunately give us a compiling error. To fix this, we can simply assign the map value to a standalone variable first. This applies to slices as well as slice values are also not addressable. Now, that's a pretty straightforward. However, what's typically more confusing to Go beginners is that concrete values stored in an interface are also not addressable. Here we have a ninja struct for demo purposes that has two methods, one of which takes in a parameter as a regular ninja object and the other one takes in a ninja object pointer. And we have interfaces and functions that call those two methods respectively. What's confusing to a lot of beginners is how these interface methods and functions are to be called. Pointer receiver and value receiver methods can be called with pointers and values respectively, as you would expect. 
and value receiver methods can be called with a pointer values because a pointer can be dereferenced. However, pointer receiver methods cannot be called with values because a value stored inside of an interface are not addressable. Another mistake beginners often make is creating these conditional clause spaghettis. As you can see in this example, in the check even and negative function, we have quite a few condition checks. For each integer parameters we pass in, we check if this integer is even and or negative, resulting in this huge mess of if-else statements. Additionally, if requirements changes and we want to add additional parameters, the nested statement will look even more ridiculous. The fortunate part is this can be easily fixed with early returns. As you can see, by using early returns, we are able to get rid of all of the nesting by getting rid of the invalid cases out of the way first. This works especially well in Go because we handle errors by checking if errors are equal to new. Instead of any other error handling patterns such as the more prevalently seen try-catch block. One quick tip that I have to avoid some of the mistakes that I've mentioned in today's video is utilizing linters. Linters are code analysis tools used to flag any bugs or errors in your project in order to make any coding style suggestions. Golang CI Lint, for example, is one of the most popular linters for Go programs. Installing and running linters like this one is extremely straightforward. If you're on a Mac machine, for example, all you need is three, four lines of commands in order to get your very first linter up and running quickly for your Go program. I've got another question for you. Have you personally made any of the mistakes that I've listed in today's video? Let me know in the comment section down below. Before you go, make sure to get your free Golang cheat sheets at golangdojo.com slash cheat sheets. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you ninjas in the very next video.